everyone and welcome to our second part of our lecture over the Rococo where we're going to be considering whether England had a Rococo period or not really. So something kind of important is just that journey of art ideas and any ideas really across the English Channel, something seems to happen before it gets there and England kind of tends to take its own approach to things. So like for example, the Baroque when it finally gets there is almost like a toned down um, Baroque. And one thing that's been going on in England is remember we're talking about the 1700s is England in the late 1600s had just been through a civil war where basically their country had been torn apart um, over a king who was trying to rule as an absolute ruler, King Charles I, and his head had been cut off and then they tried to go without a monarchy for a while and that ended up being worse. So then they went back to being a monarchy before finally establishing a couple rulers later a limited monarchy under William and Mary. You also have to remember that the French and the English have a little bit of a history over who actually controls parts of France. So England is never gonna fully embrace things that do come over from France. However, England, because of the turmoil that had been going on there over wars of religion and their civil war, they haven't really been big on the art scene. In fact, they hadn't even really had a major painter that came out of there for over 200 years. And of course we know Hans Holbein is famous in England, but he wasn't even English, he was from Europe. So he didn't even really count. So the English, after things kind of settle down after their civil war, decide that they need to start kind of regaining their image. Um, and they do follow the French idea of creating the British Royal Academy of what is gonna be acceptable for art styles and what is going to be, um, you know, used really as the main form of art in England. And they did have some major artists that are going to come out. Um, Thomas Gainsborough and Joshua Reynolds are very famous. They just weren't really covered on the 250. But we are going to talk about William Hogarth. Okay. Now, it is also noteworthy that in the early 1700s, England is going to start moving towards their industrial revolution. And one of the reasons they're able to do that is because they're not really involved in the Napoleonic Wars that are going to take place. They're not really directly affected by the chaos that's going to be happening in Europe. Plus, they had a lot of money coming in from colonies, which made it possible for them to start the Industrial Revolution. And just like in other places, like we'd seen in Flanders, you now have this merchant middle class who has some disposable income and has a taste for art. But it's cheap art. It's not necessarily going to be like the fine arts. So what we start to see is the popularity of printing and works of art or painting that could be mass produced so that the common man could get their, their hand on it. But also um, as literacy rates go up and people became more politically involved, we started to see a lot of printing and artwork being used in magazines and commentaries. So England is actually gonna be the birthplace of the political cartoon as we know it. And there was the reason for this is after the English Civil War, the people of England had a lot more freedoms. Their monarchy was very limited. There was an English Bill of Rights that were drawn up where people could not be punished necessarily for their beliefs or their ideas or things that they were saying. So freedom of press, freedom of you know expression, People in England were starting to kind of lighten up a little bit um, and poke fun at the people who originally could have had them killed or thrown in jail. And they started to really use that freedom of speech to kind of expose problems in English society that they felt were the result of traditions that have always been followed just because we've always followed them. And we start to see political cartoons that mock the upper class and, um, you know, really look at the lives of the celebrities who were there, like the Duchess of Devonshire, um, who was very, very wealthy and a huge fashionista. And one magazine could be honoring her and the next one could be bashing her and making fun of her. So, but that was kind of allowed in England because their king's hands were really tied or king and queen after the Civil War. So, William Hogarth, um, I love this quote about him, and that's other pictures we see and Hogarth's we read. And Hogarth is a political cartoonist who was very critical in helping to revive printing in England because he would create these, because we do still have a very illiterate society, he would create these works of art that could be mass produced um, in these, you know, periodicals and magazines and newspapers that could be read 
and understood by the average individual because they would recognize the things that were happening in it. So Hogarth is very good at satire and, you know, kind of poking fun and making thing, making fun of things and really having kind of a moral message with it as he wrote. Okay, so the way Hogarth's works of art would look is there would be, so uh, works of art, but it's a different type of art because it is a print and he would do different scenes that were all meant to go together to kind of tell a moral message. Um, and they are satire and they're funny, but at the same time, they're telling a very serious story commenting on the upper class. So one, se one series that he put together, so he does a lot of these, all right? And one series of works that he put together was called Marriage a la Mode. And a la Mode means in the fashion of. So. This is the fashion of marriage in 1745. And basically every single one of these that goes together in this magazine was making fun of arranged marriages and marriages that were based on money and not love. And that these aristocratic land owning families would marry into each other to make sure that, you know, the land stayed in the family and that it was a profitable marriage for the daughters and for the sons. So he was really, um, he read an essay that somebody said that marriages should be based on love. And if they were, then they would last longer and there'd be less divorce, which was less costly. And so he tells the story of an arranged marriage that ends in a dual suicide and syphilis. So basically saying that this may be the fashion of marriage, but there's nothing good that comes out of it. So for example, this scene right here is called um, the breakfast scene and you have a young couple over here on the couch who are sitting there facing away from each other like they're not even looking at each other she's already leaning towards um, another man um, and then over here on the table they're basically negotiating out um, the deals of this marriage this one guy over here on the right has this family tree to show like basically breeding and then if you look over here, there's two dogs, which would be purebred dogs. So this was kind of the equating of this marriage to breeding dogs. And the two dogs are chained together. Like they're not, you know, even looking at each other. They're chained together kind of the same way that this man and woman are going to be. And then here's Medusa, this painting up here that I really like, who's watching all this in horror, just like, this is terrible. What are we doing to this at the time? So the scene for the 250 that they want you guys to know is the breakfast scene, all right? And this is one of the paintings in the series of Marriage a la Mode. So it's one of six. Um, and this is the after the marriage scene. And there is a whole lot of things going on in this scene. So if you look at it, it looks like she's been up all night partying. Like the sun is coming up in the day. She's been up all night partying, probably gambling, um, losing all of their money. This guy who's walking away is carrying their like financial books and he's basically throwing up his hands like, I can't do anything, you guys. Are, she's lonely, she's depressed, she's squandering all her money on parties and gambling. There's clearly been some kind of party here. And then her husband has just come in from a long night and the little dog here, which is supposed to represent loyalty, um, is here sniffing a strange bonnet that he's obviously been out all night with another woman doing this. Um, and you can see here, like, it's just all of this, like, the chair is knocked over, which means somebody probably left in a hurry to get out of here. So perhaps possibly another man. So just kind of some details to add into this. Like, there's just a whole lot about it, like, that shows that it looks like at first glance, like the life is a party, like these guys are having a really great time. But underneath the scene of it, it's actually a satire showing the dangers that come from having a, you know, arranged marriage. So the question people like to discuss is whether or not um, Hogarth actually counts as Rococo, because the detail in here, you've got scenes of cherubs up here, you've got the Rococo detail in the, the dining room here. Um, all of it looks Rococo at first glance. And but underneath this, it's really making fun of those institutions that have been to, around for a really long time in England that he's saying, you know what, this may not actually be the very best thing. So whereas Rococo in France celebrates the aristocracy, this, on the other hand, seems to make fun of it even more.